One of the reasons I wanted to come in and talk to you was because I want to just talk freely. How does that all feel for you personally? That thought that one week earlier we could have saved 21,000 lives. There were some mistakes that we made in terms of the measures, yeah. how they were brought in. Well, now you see, Stephen, you're getting into gotcha questions. No, I genuinely... It's just all total rubbish. No, no, I'm not no, gonna... I've not even asked the question yet. There needs to be boundaries. You no, no, get... no, those rules yeah. were not in place. Can I ask the question? You can ask a question. I'm going to ask okay, the question. Just, yeah. This bit is really hard for me. People say you, you were a contradiction. Yeah. What's your response to that? <sighs> Could you do me a quick favour if you're listening to this? Please hit the follow or subscribe button. It helps more than you know. And we invite subscribers in every month to watch the show in person. When I started The Diary of a CEO, I wanted to create a platform where we get to see behind the scenes, where we get the truth, where we get the context. That is at least my attempt. The rest of it is up to the viewer to decide what they make of the conversation and what they take from the conversation. And the same applies to this episode. So without further ado, I'm Stephen Bartlett, and this is The Diary of a CEO. I hope nobody's listening, but if you are, then please keep this to yourself. I was really, really keen to have you come and join me in my in my kitchen here in, in London to talk in a, a long form way about a ton of different things that are front of mind for you that have gone on over the last couple of years. I think, you know, usually, and you've listened to this podcast before, so you know yeah. I typically start about with childhood and all those things, which I will get onto. But the question that was really front of mind for me, yeah. and I think will be for a lot of people, is why did you want to have this conversation here? Hmm. Well, I love your podcast. One of the reasons I love it is because I think what you manage to do is you manage to get people to be really, um, really honest about themselves. Right? One of the things I admire about the podcast is that um, it's important that we have a space where people can talk about where things go well and where people have failed and what they've learned from that. And you're so um, sort of brutally honest with yourself about it and you really put that on the line. And that in turn gets it out of other people. Mm. And, you know, I've been through this um, extraordinary experience of being the health secretary in the pandemic. There's a lot of, you know, things that I've learnt through that and learnt about myself. Um, and I, I want to be able to articulate how I saw it, if you like. I just think that you're, it, it's just one of the most self-aware podcasts that I've, I, I've listened to. And I, now I'm completely hooked. Oh. So let's start then. <clears throat> I was brought up in a happy, loving, complicated, modern family. Yeah. Explain. And well, why, why complicated? Well, complicated because my parents separated when I was two. And I effectively grew up with four parents. So the, both of them happily remarried before I can really remember. So it was complicated in the way that lots of modern families are complicated. And I have... I have a half brother, I have step brothers and sisters, but it was also it was also very it was very loving and ever you know I got that that love and support from from four parents rather than the normal two. What were you like in school? Well, one of the biggest things that happened to me was that I, I after primary school, primary school was in this lovely um very rural Cheshire nice. uh primary school, a very very uh, straightforward, small, uh, warm. And then at the age of 10, they put me in for the, or I was asked if I wanted to put, go in for the exam for the local independent school a year early. This was a, probably one of the biggest things that happened in my childhood because you know, I went and did the exam and I got through and I went to school. So I went to secondary school a year early. Suddenly I went from being, finding it all pretty straightforward to really having to struggle to keep up, really having to work hard. And both socially and academically, suddenly I was in this, uh, you know, I was in uh, with a group of big group of people who were all a year ahead of me. And combine that with my sort of my mother's worth work ethic. Mm. You know, she started her own business and worked incredibly hard. And, um, you know, that had a, it had a, it had a big impact on me. In what way? Specifically on the social side, you said yeah. you were socially struggling to keep up. Were you bullied? Um, a bit. I wouldn't say that was the main. Uh, that was the main thing. Mm -hmm. But I was. But yeah, people. It was tough. People were tough on me. Mm -hmm. um, and um, 
and I'm also quite sort of, you know, self-confident and exuberant. And that sometimes has rubbed people up the wrong way, especially when you're the little guy at school. So I think, you know, that, so that I'm, I'm sure that part of the sort of the drive that I have comes from the fact that I found myself age 10 suddenly in a very, you know, a, mm. a tough environment. And you, you ultimately must have done pretty well in that secondary school where you were trying to fit yeah. in because you went to Oxford, which is just... Yeah, so I went to Oxford a year early, you know, so I was... You went to... Oh, yeah. Because so you was, got into secondary school uh-huh, a year early. Okay. Exactly. And you studied politics, philosophy and ec- economics, right? Yeah. Which is a lot of a lot of people that go on to become politicians study, yeah. study that course. Yeah. So that seems to yeah. be almost like a bit of a rite of passage to politics in a way, because you've got, you know, people like, is it Ed Miliband, David Cameron, Jeremy Hunt, that have all yeah. studied The that. list goes on, Michael Gove. Ed Davey. Yeah. Right. Um, Ed so, Balls. Yeah. So one of the things that, as being a bit of a, a pot, like a, I guess there's two questions here. The first is, why did you choose politics? Mm. I, I thought it was just, I thought it was the most interesting thing to do. I actually got into it through the economics. So I did, I, I studied economics A-level because I was really interested in business. Right. And what, what happened was this, that, um, when I was a teenager in the early 90s, my mum's business nearly went bust. And we had a moment when we had this, uh, our major client uh, themselves was struggling in the recession in the early 90s and couldn't pay their bills. So it was a classic late payment cash crunch for a small business. We knew that if we didn't get this check mm. by the end of the week, then the company was, was going under eventually on the Wednesday or the Thursday, the check arrived and the business was saved and it went on to to prosper. But that made me ask this question, you know, how come a perfectly good business employing a load of people who are working incredibly hard, how can that go bust or be at risk of going bust for something completely outside of their control? And the sort of sense of injustice in that made me then ask, how does the economy work? And that's what led me to, to... taken interest in economics, which I had a real affinity with. I loved it as an A-level subject. And that, so that's what led me to, to, um, to PPE. At at that age, say like 18, 19, 20. Yeah. Were you, were you aspiring to become a politician? No, I was inspiring, aspiring to become an entrepreneur. So I actually, I almost did economics and management at Oxford. And then somebody told me it was easier to get into PPE than economics and management. So, and that sounded close enough to what I wanted to do. Right. So that's why I ended up doing it. Is there not, because because when I, because people have said to me, you know, I've had business success and all these things, I've built yeah. a platform. People say, have suggested, oh, maybe you should go into politics, Steve. And the thing that scares the life out of me is, yeah. it's like a lose-lose game. People are going to fucking hate you regardless of what you do. So I, I, I sometimes wonder, I'm like, well, who are these people that like, yeah. Want to be politicians. Yeah. So, it's, well, thanks. Um, the, um, <laughs> it's but it's true, right? And my, my experience as health secretary is, uh, is you get, you know, some people uh, are, some people love you and some people hate you, right? I was I, I was on the tube la- and I never know what that, what, what, how it's going to be mm. when they come up and see me. So I was on the tube last night um, and some enormous guy in a heavy metal t-shirt and long hair comes up to me and I'm like, oh, okay, how's this going to go? Mm. And he said, I just want to say thanks. I got my vaccines because of you and I'll never forget it. I was like, oh, well, that went, that could have gone worse. <laughs> and, wow. and so, and so, you, you know, and, and obviously not every interaction is, um, uh, is as cheerful to, to put it diplomatically. Mm. And so in a way, you know, that is part of it. You know that if you're going to make a big decision that affects lots of people's lives, some people are going to like it and some people aren't. Um, that isn't what got me into politics. What got me into politics was the observation that that's where the big decisions are made. And quite rightly in a democracy, you know, the big calls in economics to stop other people going through the same experience that I did as an early teenager with my parents' business, where it mm. almost went bust for something completely outside their control. And that, and that, and that's what drove me. And the combination of the interest and, you know, because it's very interesting politics mm. and the mission uh, got me there. Um, so one of the things that has also always leveled uh, the like political system in our country Ooh. is that, and you kind of see this from, you know, you studied politics, philosophy and economics at Oxford, yeah. is that a lot of the people that do go on to make those big decisions, as, yeah. you, as you've described, yeah. they come from like privilege. Right. Right. And even, you know, you, you know, your parents went through a tough time, but living in Cheshire is, yeah. I'd rather live there than yeah. on Moss side. Right. Yeah. 
it's a it's a it's a privileged place to to grow up and to live and going into an independent school. You went to King's King's School Chester, King, yeah. King's School in Chester as well, yeah. which is a, a privileged place to come from. Yeah. So one of the things that I've always contended with, and is you know, and honestly, one of the things that actually quite quite honestly put me off ever going into politics was this prospect that it's kind of this elitist club where they all come from Oxford, and and then the problem you have with that, if that is true, right, is that the decisions then that are made for all of us, yeah are made from people yeah. that have walked a different set of foot yeah, pathways, paths. right? Okay, so I think there's a few bits. Let's park the Oxford point, because actually, if we get, if Oxford and Cambridge and the other top universities get mm. it right, mm. then actually they are great um, meritocratic levellers, because the thing that Oxford really did for me, not only taught me how to read and write, but it also, it took a provincial boy from Cheshire Mm. and put him into exactly the group that you describe, right? So I was from a very much a middle-class background. But if those the, the top universities get their, their selection right, who they choose, and mm. if they get the, the support right, so that people from your sort of background feel encouraged and drawn towards them and then supported once you get there, then they can be great levellers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so but let's park the sort of Oxbridge debate because sure. that's a sort of, uh, sure, you know, not, uh, that debate will go on for as long as those universities are preeminent, I imagine. I think the most important thing in politics is where, where you're going and what you're trying to achieve. And one of the most important skills that I think is incredibly hard to communicate in politics but is vital to doing the job well is empathy, mm. right? And you can't walk other people's um, uh, shoes except through empathy. And and you, the lived experience of a particular background is incredibly important. And I'm I'm a you know I'm a big fan of welcoming people, trying to get people into politics from all sorts of backgrounds. So I'm not disagreeing with your critique. The point is, each and every one of us has our own background. The way that you can try to get over the problem that you describe is through empathy. And that's and that's incredibly important. I can't have empathy for what it's like to be a woman, for example, because I've never been one. No, so that's I, not true. You can have empathy for but it. Not, but, so yeah, I can have empathy, but I, 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 I believe that empathy comes, real, real true empathy for someone else comes from understanding the pain or struggle or situation they're going yeah. through. Yeah. And I can never truly understand the pain or struggle that, say, for example, a woman facing discrimination yeah. when she's trying to raise money right. is going through because I have never experienced that. So I can guess what it might feel like. It's like almost like the topic of racism, I think. Like yeah. no one can know, I don't know how a white male politician that's gone yeah. to Oxford will know what it's like to be called the N-word on the playground when I was 11 and how that made me feel like the feelings of shame and yeah. being different that I then went on to feel. Yeah. So so I I've, I tend to believe that the, the way we create a truly empathetic political system yeah. is by finding a way to get people in that have come from yeah. like low economic housing yeah. and different backgrounds and minorities. So when I look at the political landscape and I see that a lot of, you know, a lot of people have come through a very, t like, too many people have come through a very privileged background. It m makes me think that the decisions that are going to go on to be made will lack that true understanding of what it's like to grow up in a house that ha is like damp and moldy and there's rats and stuff. So th there's, there's, I'm grinning because there's two ways to answer this, right? But the thing that's absolutely screaming at me to say to you is mm. that is why you should go into politics. But right? I feel like I can't but get in because, because... Of course you can get in. You'd be... Uh, you'd be I'll, I'll sign you up now. It depends which party you want to join. That's uh, I, I can only speak for one of them, but, <laughs> yeah. but go for it. So firstly, that's my actual response. But the other thing is, it's, it is it is wrong to say that you cannot, um, uh, that you can't empathise with, with others and others' situations. You can't have lived somebody else's life, mm. but you can seek to try to, um, to understand where they're coming from. And, and I certainly do that. And, you know, that's part of representing a constituency. I think it's actually really hard to communicate in politics, mm. uh, this, this, the empathy point, because it's really easy to generalise. Um, and, and it comes down to the fact that if you poll people, right, most people think that politicians are useless. But when you name a politician, they tend to think that they're, they're, mm. they're local person, they're local MP, they tend to think that they're great, right? So there's a gap mm. between what people think of politicians as a whole 
mm-hmm. and think of individuals who they've interacted with. Yeah, yeah. I think I think I think I can de- def- definitely emp- empathize with pain and suffering and all of those things. I just think in order to create a truly like representative political system, sure, it needs to be full of people who have actually gone through those things. Go as for opposed it. To, you Join. Know, it, Get well, involved. I think the thing that's always put me off is because when I heard about this, like you know, everyone's come, you know, a lot of p- politicians have come from a certain background, and then you see how promotions and stuff are done. It makes me think that it's a bit of a like a uh, you know a system where we're we're promoting our friends and bringing them up, and if they've gone to Oxbridge and I went, you know, I studied with them, I'll I'll promote them when I get there. So I want. I, it's always felt to me like r- running would be very, very, very difficult um, because I didn't go. I don't come from that sort of privileged Oxbridge, like typically quite boys club place. Yeah, that's how it feels, right, for it, me. So it, I, I might be wrong. I, I think I I, I, re- I really think you're wrong okay. because I think actually the system in a way. Um, uh, because of this problem, mm-hmm. um, the system is actually tries to draw people through faster. Mm. Um, is it doing a good enough job? Uh, it's just, I mean, look at actually, um, give him his credit, you know, look at who Boris Johnson has put in his cabinet, right? And um, I know that you're immediately thinking of people he was at the same school and university as, right? Yeah. Um, but there are an awful lot of people who weren't. Right? And I don't want to go through the individual backstory mm. of, you know, the guy who arrived age nine from uh, Kurdistan with only a pa- his dad with only a pound in his pocket. Yeah. Right. Um, Sajid Javid, who grew up in one of the poorest streets in Bristol and made it uh, from there. And by the way, who's from a family of amazing, amazing uh, men. Um, his, I think he's got four brothers. There's five of them. Um uh, uh, Rishi Sunak, right? He grew up in a his his mum's a pharmacist. He grew up in a pharmacy, right? There are there are loads of people who have made it from difficult backgrounds, and and actually, I, I'm sad that you have the impression that mm. you, that you do because it's not really my experience of uh, of of being there. So you, you you make the decision then to move towards politics. You become eventually George Osborne's chief of staff in 2000 and. In five ish, yeah, yeah, and in 2010, you became the MP for Mid Suffolk, West Suffolk, West Suffolk, yeah. okay, yeah. right, and that that was your, I guess your your entry into politics, yeah. And moving forward, then you 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 know you get promoted a few times, and then Theresa May comes in and mm-hmm. demotes you, yeah, yeah. So she demoted you to Minister of State of Digi- it, it, Digital Culture, Digital and Culture, and God, that was a brilliant job. I mean, so why did she demote you? She demoted me because they decided they wanted a uh, a clean break from the Cameron Osborne years. She didn't like George Osborne. George, George Osborne. Well, she fired him pretty brutally. And I was just, you know, head below the parapet enough to get through. And she demoted me. I was I was attending the cabinet at the time. And um, she, I, I remember the, the meeting. It was, um, they had told the press that they were going to fire people until 11 a.m. and then start hiring people. And I was asked to go and see her at 10.50. Uh-huh. So I thought, oh, this isn't going to go very well. I walked in and I was, uh, she'd been running about 15 minutes late. So I walk in and there's a clock on the wall in her housecommons office and it says 11.05. And I said, oh, it's gone 11. So I guess this is going to be okay. <laughs> And because I thought, well, you know, at least make a laugh if she's going to be firing me, you know, why, why make it unpleasant? And uh, she said, well, that depends how you react. Because um, I, uh, there isn't a, a space for you in my cabinet, uh, but I know you're really interested in digital. And that's one of the big things that's going on in the world. Uh, so would you like to be the, uh, the number two uh, in DCMS and... Uh, and and be responsible for digital policy and just keep your head down and and sort and um and sort that out and i i leapt at it it was absolutely wonderful this is m- maybe a bit of my political naivety but when i when i was reading through that you'd be, you'd been the minister for like digital business enterprise energy and ultimately health yeah how can one person yeah, know anything yeah. about any of that stuff? Yeah. And so, how can anyone be a master of like yeah. five six different things? Yeah, cuz that's not the job. So um it's not the job to be the master. In a way, it's the job to be the people's representative amongst the experts. So your job as the minister is to be able to be the representative of the people Mm. who is responsible for the direction of that policy area. And you have endless, 
experts. Your job is not to be an expert, it's to listen to the experts and then decide democratically what direction do we want to go. So take, I mean, an area that I do know, you know I, I did have a background in, take on um, the future of the internet. And um, what, what was on, your background in that? Uh, well, only that I, I, you know, I can code and I understand a bit of um, about technology. But the big question was, how do you keep children safe online? Mm. Right? And how you make take the internet from a sort of a wild west mm. and social media to a place where people have more protection, you know, is it, that was the the the, the the you know most important question in that area at the time. And for that, yes, you need experts, but you mm. also need a you basically need a, a, a view of where you want to get to. It's a it's a it's you want to. You, you need to set the mission and the direction. It's, Let's it's, talk about it's that. It's leadership that's needed. My background social media. And yeah. I actually, whenever I see like the social media policies being set, I always, the, the debate we have in social media and digital is like, who is it that's making these decisions? Because the people we yeah. see, yeah. when we see, obviously the spokespeople, as you've described, yeah. we know that they don't know it like us. Yeah. So we think that we, 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 we pray that the decisions aren't made poorly. So let's take, cause, yeah. cause that can be the subject we use to describe all of these industries that you've, you've led as minister. So, as it relates to say social media, when you're trying to understand what policies to set for yeah. children to yeah. keep them safe, yeah. you're telling me there's this like group of experts behind the scenes yeah. who are discussing and feeding information. Yeah. And then your role to play is in deciding- Yeah, on the what, trade-offs. The trade-offs, yeah. right? Which would, would which needs expertise it to needs, know what the trade-offs are. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then also, and communicating them. Communicating it to the mm-hmm. public, yeah. And understanding what the public is expecting. Because okay. sometimes experts can get so close to their subject matter mm. that you've got to be like, well, yeah, but there's, you know, there's 60 million people over there who aren't experts okay. and they n- need the voice sure, in the room true. as well. Yeah. You're ultimately the person when you're in charge of digital that is making these calls. So you speak to the experts, then make the calls. Mm-hmm. My, my thing is on a topic like digital, the harm that can be done if yeah. someone doesn't understand that yeah. area of expertise, yeah. because ultimately the minister makes the call, yeah. you can like destroy an industry, cripple an, like, cripple an economy. So I've always thought that the person making the call yeah. should be should be really experienced in that subject matter. And that doesn't seem to be the case because of the design of the political system. Because of democracy, Stephen. It's yeah. democracy. And that's good and right, mm. right? Because when you have technocratic government, you can you just get pe- you know, experts are so focused on their area mm. that sometimes they just don't see the big picture. So and you're saying you need that impartial kind of outsider to Yeah, that's what that's what I tried to be as a okay. as a as a minister. Um and also so it's about lifting people's eyes to the to the, the, you know, the big social trade-offs. And I mean that in the mm. best sense that, you know, the trade-offs within society, um, how free to be versus uh, how safe to be mm-hmm. in the in the internet. It's an absolute classic of political philosophy, right? Mm-hmm. The, and um, people have been worrying about that question in the offline world for 300 years. And we were bringing that sort of approach mm-hmm. um, into the online world, as opposed to just leaving it as a completely libertarian space. Um, but the the job is to is to synthesize the expert view, but not just not just follow it because the experts can become so focused, but also they can't sometimes provide the leadership yeah. right to say we we're going over there and and you know like yes of course we're going to take on um, uh, Facebook over some of the harmful content yeah of mm-hmm. course we are we're not just going to lie down and say that they can make the rules up. It's interesting because when I see the political debates with things like Facebook, a lot of the government officials, both here and in the US, haven't got a fucking clue what Facebook is. And you can see them asking Mark Zuckerberg the most dumb, yeah. naive questions yeah. about the platform. And then as an outsider watching yeah. that these people that don't understand what they're talking about are ultimately going to be writing the legislation. As someone that works in the industry and could actually tell you what, in my view, yeah. having worked in the industry for 10 years, deep in it, yeah. that fully understands things like the Cambridge Analytica scandal yeah. and data data privacy, yeah. and really also understands the context of the media pressure, yeah. which is sometimes uh, comes, doesn't come, is it agenda-based? Um, yeah. And, and I'm, I worry right, so getting that we a don't rational, have experts. Get it, right, so getting a rational solution out of that bundle of problems yeah. is not easy. Yeah. So what would you, uh, it, can it, is but there it, but it is demo, but it, but it is democratic to ensure that somebody who is, who represents, um, represents people mm. is 
ultimately making the decision. But if they're any good, they'll listen to the advice that you get. I think I think my view is that they should represent the people for sure. And I think that spokesman role in leadership is incred- incredibly important. But I also feel like they should ha- like have deep understanding of the nuance and complexity and have experience in the thing, which kind of brings me on to, you became in charge of health as well. Yeah. The health yeah. minister, which is obviously yeah. something not in your wheelhouse. No. So I'm, I'm a, um, doctors ask me, you know, why should a non-doctor yeah. be responsible for the health service? Now, two answers to that. First is, well, it's pretty arrogant of doctors to say it should be a doctor. Well, what about a nurse, right? Because there's more nurses in the NHS than doctors. Park that minor local issue, right? The reason is because I am there as the representative, not just of those who work in the health service, but of the people who use the health service, which is to say all of us. Mm. And so I think actually it's better for the health secretary to essentially be somebody who is a who is there on the side of the patient's you, of course you listen to the the clinical advice, you know, and some of the most amazing brains in the world, right? Like like Chris Whitty, Jonathan Van Tam. These people are amazing, wonderful communicators, very shrewd advisors. Ultimately, it's right that the person taking the decisions is representing the people through the democratic process we have mm-hmm. um, and not representing the uh, the producers, if you like, that is a that is a better way of structuring it. Well, you think you, you believe that? Because I, I really do. I, yeah. I mean, I look. I I don't know these issues d- deeply enough to n- to know the full complexities, and this is maybe even proving my point that I don't understand the nuance, nuance of politics, so I can't actually say if that's a better or worse system. One would assert, though, that the best solution might be to have someone who understands the side of the patients because they are one. We're all humans. We all live in this society, so we use the NHS. That gives yeah. me a little bit of empathy as to the the you know the the the, the, the system from a patient's perspective, yeah. but also someone that understands health and, yeah. and the nuances of that. Maybe that's spent the last 10 or 20 years, at, you know, working within the industry and can understand those layers, you know, more than someone who was working in digital five minutes ago can. Uh, it's just an observation as a, like a naive outsider. Yeah, yeah. That, like, Look, it's why do these common... people that don't have experience in a subject matter become the minister for it? Yeah, it's quite a common, um, it? it's, it's quite a common critique of politics. Mm. Um, and different countries deal with it in different ways, right? So some countries, the entire cabinet is made up of people who aren't in parliament. Um, like, you know, the US cabinet is made up of people who, who have to, by law, not be in the Senate or the House of Representatives. But then you get even more of a divide between the sort of political and the, and the democratic over here yeah. and the essentially technocratic over there. Actually, I think that our system is better than the US system right. because it's because these two things are... Uh, emerge together Um, because you do you get in taking these decisions you get incredible uh, um, advice you get access to you know the all the industry experts that you want to talk to and and ultimately you're making you know you're making balanced judgments the way the UK does it as well is the civil service will never put forward a proposal that they don't think is workable that's the that's the deal right so Mm -hmm. you do have these long-term experts who have been in in the field um and they will, uh, they'll say, okay, this is where, the way I, th- I tried to do it, was I'd say, this is where I think we need to get to. How should we best get there? And mm-hmm. then the experts will come up with a plan of how to get there. Okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, you might have a view on some of the details of that, but essentially I saw my job as saying, this is the mission and then communicating how we get there sure. and then being advised By on experts. the way from A to B. Because the, the thing you lose if you go for your model is you lose the democratic input and... Um, and, and that can lead to things going wrong. In 2019, you, when Theresa May stepped down, you ran to be the next prime minister, or at least yeah. to lead the party, right? Well, and, and that would lead you to being the prime minister. Yeah. Um, why did you want to be the prime minister? Because I thought that there was a need for a complete fresh start. Did you think you'd win? No. <laughs> at least you're honest. <laughs> yeah. No, but I, I had fun trying. Um, <laughs> No, I didn't. I didn't think I'd win, um, but I wanted to get some. I wanted to get some arguments made. Right? I worried that my. I worried that we were the party was talking not enough about how it's enterprise that leads to prosperity. Is it a publicity thing running? Because they. I watch the U.S. elections every year. I'm obsessed with it, and it. And the same people run every year. They know they're not going to win, but I think the the exposure and publicity you get is incredible. 
Yeah, there's a, there, of course, um, that's one of the consequences. I basically had an argument I wanted to make, which, which was, one? which was, okay, Brexit decision has been taken. Uh, let's get that done and get on to building a stronger economy in the future and basically get it done as quickly as we can and move forward. That was the argument I wanted to make. I managed to make the argument quite sort of loudly because I was running. Mm. Um, and then, um, uh, well, and then I pulled out. Pulled out, came seventh, got behind Boris. I, seven out of um, ten, was it? Hmm? Did you come seventh out of ten? Was it? I don't know, sixth or seventh. Oh, yeah. And then but, you got behind Boris. And then I got behind Boris. Um, because it, you knew he would win. Yeah, it was obvious that he was going to win. Also, I came to the view that um, he he could sort the problem that we were stuck with of Brexit better than any of the other candidates. Um, and also, I thought, you know, this guy has great capabilities and he needs people around him. I've had so many people tag me on Instagram, even on Telegram and in my Twitter DMs, in a picture of them starting their Huel journey. And it's one of the most amazing things in my life that I get to do a podcast, which of course needs money to, to, to fuel. And I have a sponsor like Huel, who I genuinely believe is gonna help every single person who starts their Huel journey change their life. Because this podcast, the central intention of this podcast is to help people live better lives. And we get to sit here and I get to promote to you a product which has not only helped me change my life, but is gonna help millions of people and is helping millions of people live a nutritionally complete life. It's so it's such an incredible product. And for me, the reason why it's incredible is because it gives me my protein, it gives me my vitamins, minerals, it's plant-based, it's low in sugar, gluten-free. It does all of that in a small drink that tastes good. There are other products, there's foods, there's the hot and savory collection, many other things. But for me, this ready to drink is the absolute savior of my diet throughout the week where I'm moving at such pace. Look, I don't wanna labor the point, but if you haven't tried, you'll give it a try. And if you do, tag me. Instagram, wherever you try it, give me a tag. Anyway, back to the podcast. We move forward to COVID, yeah. which was, you know, you, you get a appointed as being the health minister when a pandemic rolls in. I know. I remember I remember seeing the um the the Chinese publication on the 1st of January. So it was New Year's Day and I saw this uh, thing on the inside pages of one of the newspapers um to say um the Chinese have just uh, announced that there's a a new uh disease um and nobody knew we didn't know it was a coronavirus it might have been a flu. Uh, and nobody knew whether it was serious or not. But I remember thinking, well, maybe this is it. But I didn't really think it was until um, uh, until a couple of weeks later. When, when was that? That Because I, you know, I was reading through all of the minutes from your SAGE meetings to try and understand yeah. the, the kind of phases of... Yeah. Because listen, I run business, right? And we have crises and chaos yeah. and all those things. And yeah. There's various stages you go through of trying to understand exactly what this is and then how, you know, how impactful it's going to be yeah. and then what we should be doing. Yeah. And I kind of ran through all of that. So when, when in your view, did you start to realize that this wasn't just yeah. a cold? Or yeah, end of January. So the Chinese published the sequence of the genome of the, of the virus. So we then knew it was a coronavirus. Um, that was bad news, right? Because we had a stockpile of flu vaccine uh, for this sort of emergency, if it had been a flu. Um, and the fact that it was a coronavirus and spreading this rapidly in China was bad news. And then at that point, I remember Chris Whitty saying to me, it's 50-50. Something this contagious, either they can hold it in China or if it gets out of China, it's going to go global. So we were, by the end of January, we were on to um, developing the vaccine, for instance, um, and uh, trying to get the testing system up and running. And then we had this surreal month during February when nobody else was sort of thinking that this was a big thing. And we still thought it was 50-50, but 50% chance of a global pandemic is, you know, very, very bad. And we were, I remember standing next to the speaker's chair in the House of Commons for a PMQs, watching every single question was about something else. And nobody asked a question about what became known as COVID. And I remember thinking at the end of the session, the end of half hour, Every single question that has been asked is totally irrelevant because 
it's all about other things. And we've got this one fact in China, and it is, it, it, it's totally dominant. Why weren't you raising the bell? Oh, I was. I was giving statements to Parliament and what have you, and we were preparing inside government for what needed to happen. So at the end of January, uh, uh, JVT came and said, um, I said, how long will it take to get a vaccine? He said, well, normally it would take five years, but we think we can do it in a year to 18 months. He said that in January? Yeah, if everything goes well. And I said, your mission is to have a vaccine by Christmas. And we, we he, he and the team that we built pulled it off. Um, so we were getting things moving. And then it was when we saw the pictures from Italy. Do you remember the, yeah, you know, awful. that was the moment that I knew it was global. And that was what month? That was the end of February. February, yeah. Yeah, it was the end of February half term. Because everything was calm at this point. We were watching it happen overseas. I mean, like, I remember this, the China scenes. Yeah. Everyone was kind of calm about it. Oh, China are having a problem. That's kind of how it felt. And mm-hmm. then the Italy moment mm-hmm. was was terrifying. Yeah, that was the moment when it was obvious it was coming. Right. Um, and um, I remember having a call that, uh, my, my my German opposite number who I got you know became very close to he phoned me up he said have you seen these pictures out of Italy I was like yeah he was like this is it and he was like yeah this is it um, so that was the end of yeah that was the end of February but still in March there was a lot of confusion in those sage mi- mi- minutes about what to do yeah about what was going to happen yeah could, could, do, could we stop it yeah could, you know. complete lack of data that's the that was the problem total positive data um we had a um, we didn't have a testing regime. We had to build that from scratch, uh, and so you didn't know how many people had it. Um, we didn't know the characteristics of the disease. Uh, we didn't know what the um, we didn't know what you know what the symptoms were largely because the symptoms of COVID are so varied that they didn't have a full symptom list. One of the things that we didn't know for ages, which we now take for granted, knowing is how many people have had it and have got the antibodies. There was a big debate after the first peak of um, some people saying, uh, they're optimists like me, but it turns out far, far too optimistic, right? Saying, oh, you know, three quarters of the people must have had it by now. So basically we're fine uh, and we're through it. And then, so I got a survey done, taking people's blood and got the, got a representative sample. It took ages to get this thing up and running and we eventually got the data through that said that something like in london 15 percent of people had had it and outside london it was under five it's like christ that means almost nobody's had it and still we've had all these deaths and that means you know that was the moment we knew we had a major problem because there was no way through this other than the vaccine. And Sage, at this point, and the, the meetings that you're having there, there's kind of this resignation that it is going to just wipe through the population. But yeah. the, but the issue is the yeah. the objective is now just to try and stop it smashing the NHS, basically. Yeah. So the, the what happened was you know we saw those predictions of the uh, the reasonable worst case scenario, but the big problem was we were going up the reasonable worst case scenario quickly. You know, and I remember. I remember, of course, I remember the the day that the first person in the UK um, died of COVID. But but I remember the day that oddly, something like the 32nd person died. And it's a funny, to say that number, but it's a, there's a reason for it. I was sitting on the side of my bath at home and I got the news that we'd had 30, 32 deaths. And suddenly there was a, this isn't, you know, one person for whom we've got a protocol of how you manage that. Um, terrible as that is this is like big numbers and it was a big jump in the number and i knew that 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 number was going to get bigger and the worst period the the most um sort of frightening period of the whole thing was after we'd done the lockdown we'd pulled every lever we could so i remember sitting in the cabinet room and saying we're going to have to tell people to stop all unavoidable social contact Mm. and you probably remember you know, that being said. And um, the the really frightening time was after we'd done all those things, brought in the lockdown, we'd done everything, right? And if this disease had carried on going up, there was there was absolutely nothing more we could do. We'd shut the schools, we'd shut hospitals, you know, we'd pulled, we, you know, we'd set out at the start of March a, 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 a set of options of mm. levers that we could pull to try to stop this thing. And by the middle of March, we'd pulled every lever. And... 
it was a um, and and the, so the next two weeks, as the numbers carried on going up, it carried on going up for about ten days because of the incubation period. That was that was that was really scary. And then and then the, and then they started to turn. And then we knew we could get this thing under. The control. criticism levelled at the UK is that we were the last like major Western country to pull those levers you've described in mid March. And when you look through the minutes, there is just like several weeks of like con- confusion and indecision. And obviously in those weeks, as you've described there, yeah. what you didn't, from what I've seen in the minutes and yeah. subsequent interviews, is what you didn't know was the speed of transmission that was yeah. going on. Yeah. And obviously because of that 14 day death delay. Delay, yeah. So so it's funny that I'm, you know, it's funny that the previous conversation we had was about how you should have the experts making the decisions. Yeah. The truth is we didn't have the, the experts didn't have the data either. Mm. So these were difficult calls. Actually, in terms of, where we were on the curve, we pulled the levers ahead of other countries because we were a bit behind Italy and and um, uh, 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 Spain. Um, but the um, but the yeah, lockdown these were, lever. So Spain yeah. and Spain, France, and Italy went they, into lockdown on the 9th of March. Yeah, but and we they, we reckoned that we were several weeks behind them in terms of the progress of the virus that it as in it had come to those countries first, right. and then from them to us. But either way, and that was wrong. The big picture, we we were much closer than, to them than 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 uh, we were being than the best estimate, right? By right. these by the best people who were in Sage, the the scientists. And, you know, what it felt like was, this is an enormous call. So the costs of action are huge. The costs of inaction are also huge. So, you you know, we knew when we were sitting around the cabinet take- table making these decisions that the, 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 the balance between these two was an enormous, enormous unknown. So in a, with an unprecedented virus with very little data, mm. we were essentially, you know, doing these things that were so, we knew we were very, it were going to be very damaging. If you think about the story about, I I told earlier about coming in, I, I came into politics partly because I had this searing formulative experience of something completely outside of our control, nearly knocking out the livelihood of my family, right? And here I am participating in decisions that were going to have a more devastating impact on on businesses uh, and 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 people who rely on social contact in order to to survive and thrive. So we were hugely aware of the of the pain that would come from the decisions, mm. as well as the pain that would come from uh, from delay. And the other thing that we didn't know was how the public would react, right? And this is there. There's an optimistic story which is the public were amazing, you know? And, and the advice that we were getting was, we're not sure whether the public will, will, will put up with lockdown for very long. Um, and so you've got to time the period of lockdown. Actually, the public were amazing once you explained that, you know, there's a serious problem. Mm. Um, we're all going to have to uh, do something. It's going to be uncomfortable, but we'll get through it together. And the public were amazing. Obviously, with Italy, Spain and France locking down first, there was also a bit of a case study as to how publics will react if, yeah. if presented in a certain way yeah. um, to the lockdowns. The Because we were later in locking down people, mm-hmm. if you look at the numbers, they say that there's about 20, if we'd locked down a week earlier, 21,000 people would still be alive from that first wave. When, when you hear that, yeah. what, how does that, how does that sound and feel? And also around that time, Boris Johnson goes and does that interview and references one of the options being taking it on the chin. And then in hindsight, how does that all feel for you personally? That thought that one week earlier, we could have saved 21,000 lives. Yeah. Um, it's obviously it's something that I'll, I'll always think about. Um, you know, if I search for what I really believe about that, and the honest truth is, the honest truth is that we didn't know. And of course, you know, hindsight is a wonderful thing. And it was about, it was judgment based on, on, on these, you know, this, the, 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 the balance of these two scales. Um, and, um, I think that whenever you go through a period of history, 
ultimately it's about learning from it. You know, you've got to make sure that that if this if a pandemic, you know, disease happens again, we'll be far better prepared. And I think that the I think the Far East was far better prepared because they'd been through mm-hmm. MERS and SARS. And and um honestly that how how I feel is like I really wish we'd known then what we knew now. What well, what if you in hindsight then, because we're playing games of hindsight now, which are as as they say it's 2020 but what are when you look back honestly at the decisions that were made and how you got the data and the way that the meetings were handled with sage and all of these and ultimately what led to these decisions what in hindsight which is a wonderful thing Mm. that we can only deploy in in the past yeah in hindsight what do you think were the mistakes all the areas where we could have done better in the decision making how we got the information and all those things what were those mistakes in hindsight well um you know we made there were some mistakes that we made in terms of the measures, yeah. how they were brought in. As in not hard enough or? Just, you know, just details about the things that really, really matter to people. Um, I'll give you one example. Um, funerals. Hmm. We brought in rules saying that six people could go to a, a funeral, I think it was. It, very, very restrictive. But for some people, especially people who were shielding, the rules were interpreted as, in some cases, even the spouse shouldn't go to the funeral if they were shielding. Now, that was that was terrible. I remember watching that the film of a young boy who died, who was buried by people in hazmat suits without his parents there. And... You know, that was just awful. And, you know, you listen to that, right? And we changed the rules and made it made it clear. So, you know, that was a that was all, all the time. I'd say, you know, all the time we were on the lookout for, okay, what do we need to be doing differently? Because it was unprecedented. And there was a... Um, a and... It, you know, in hindsight, some of it looks like these were sort of hard and fast and obvious decisions. They weren't obvious decisions at all. And we were constantly sort of questioning ourselves uh, in terms of um, in terms of whether we got the judgment right. What was your life like in that time? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I, so my alarm went off at six o'clock every morning. And um, I'd, um, you know, I, I basically had about a half an hour with the kids in the morning. And then uh, I'd get picked up at 7.30, maybe 7 o'clock. And, uh, and, then, and then work, it was just, you know, unbelievable um, until about, about midnight. And I, you know, what my, my permanent secretary, Chris Wormwald, at the start said, this is not going to be over in a, in a couple of weeks, right? You've got to get, we've all got to get ourselves into a position where we can just keep going. This is a marathon, not a sprint. And, um, um, and there was a, um, a, we- a weekend basically meant that we didn't start work till about nine. And so that was the, you know, that was the, the time off, so to speak. And that, it was like that for three or four months during that what, what about your mental health position? Because I, yeah, you know, because that feeling that going home every day with that feeling that my decisions could sway, as we saw negatively in this case, you know, 21 million, 21,000 lives for yeah. better or for worse. And ultimately, yeah. you know, 160,000 people died. Yeah. You're going home with that every day yeah. with that thought that your deci- the decisions you're making now as yeah. health secretary yeah. are life and death. Yeah. How do you relax? So, How do you- yeah, well, I think that's... Relaxation I got to through exercise, um, but the um, in the health department the sense was a total sense of mission. Um, and I've never been in the military, but some people say this is what it's like when you're on a military operation as well. Um, as in, there was a focus over how to optimize how we could make decisions. You know, of course there were sleepless nights. Really, we thought, you know, when we had some, you know, Chris Whitty himself is a brilliant advisor on how to keep yourself, you know, personally in the, um, in, in the zone. So the, the sense of mission that we were trying to solve something that was incredibly difficult as best as we could um, was very, very strong in that period. Did you have anxiety? 
it depends what you mean by anxiety. Of course, I was anxious about every, you know, that all these big of, decisions. That, that awful sense of nervousness that, you know, can be crippling at times. You know that? Yeah, but it was yes up to the bit, but not about, I, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't find it, I, I didn't find it crippling. I found it motivating. Do you, do you know, when I say anxiety, do, do you know what I mean? It, I mean, there's the the kind of phrase of describing something as being an anxious situation, but then actually yeah. suffering with anxiety. Yeah, I, not not in a medical, I didn't feel that in a Fine. medical sense. I basically felt like I got up in the morning and I did my level best and then I went to sleep and then I woke up and repeated the exercise. And that, for me, that was the only way to get through it without sort of collapsing in a hoop. If you'd known that a pandemic would roll in, would you have avoided that health secretary job? <laughs> Be honest with me. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. That's a great question. Someone's got to do it. Would you have... If you knew that that situation was coming... If I knew you... the situation was coming, there's about a hundred things I'd immediately have done, right? We would have... No, so, no, no. I mean, would you put yourself in that role if you'd knew that? If if I said now there's a pandemic coming next week, do you want, do you want the job of being health secretary? <laughs> That's such a what if question. But I, I would answer it. The so, honest truth is yes. You would take it. Yeah. Okay. Because someone's got to make the decisions. Okay. So one of the one of do the you know what do you know what the the overriding sense is um, that I'm trying to articulate not particularly well is a sense of is a sense of duty, right? When the really bad stuff happens. And, and you're in the job, you've got to stand up and be counted. One of the decisions that was made was, and ultimately criticised is this whole care home yeah. stuff. What's your view on that before we yeah, get so, to Yeah, so, okay, this is a really good example of um, the, 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 of, 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 of learning from what you're seeing on the ground. So the criticism runs that um, the NHS made a decision to get people out of hospitals because we needed hospital space and send them into care homes, and that took COVID with them, and a lot of people died. Mm -hmm. um, that criticism is wrong. Um, but there's a different criticism, which is more accurate. The, re the reason that's wrong is um, twofold. And there's been a piece of work, that's a piece of uh, analysis that's done that's shown that approximately 2% of the uh, infections that got into care homes were from that route. Um, the, um, and the reason for that is that when those people went into the care homes, they were they then isolated in the care homes um, because they weren't tested because the tests didn't exist. Now I wish to God that the tests had existed, and we you know that was a big part of my life trying to build this testing system. Um, but they they didn't exist, and most of those people who left hospital actually went home, not into not into care homes. The truth is that the peak in the care homes came about a month later. So the facts don't even stack up this narrative. But there've been, there's, you know, there's a few false narratives that have got going about the pandemic, and that's one of them. The truth is, and we couldn't say it, we didn't want to say it at the time because we didn't want to demotivate people. But the truth is that the main route of the virus getting into care homes, sadly, was from staff because staff live in the community and this disease was rife in the community. But I didn't want to stand at that podium and give the impression I was blaming the staff. The thing that we then did was we changed the rules so you could not lit work in more than one care home. Mm. And in the second wave, the number of deaths in care homes was far, far lower. Yeah. And we had the testing. So actually, the, the, what we needed to have done was do, the, do the, poli the staff movement policy much earlier. And we hadn't, we hadn't spotted that that was the route. Um, and so, you know, there, there's an inquiry that will come and go through all these things. And I'm actually looking forward to it because there's a whole series of points where we've got to make sure we learn the right lesson. Uh, and then there's a couple of other things that are upper there that, you know, just aren't true and need to be like this whole, you know, we talked about criticism as a politician, mm -hmm. right? One of the things I've been criticised for is for giving a contract to the local pub landlord, right? I don't know whether you've yeah. read that story. Yeah, yeah I've heard all of that right? stuff, yeah. It's just not true. We'll talk about that. I want to just, because the, the, the point on the care home, bit, yeah, okay. it's good. You, so you've answered one of my points there, which was about that whole rumour that people were being released from the NHS into care homes and that was causing issues. The yeah. thing that that I, that I saw from the Sage minutes was that on the, roughly the 10th of March, which was fairly early in all of this, yeah. Sage did say that they, there should be special policy consideration given to care homes yes. and various types of, types of retirement communities. Yes. Presumably you had the data at that point that said, 
elderly people yeah, were being exactly. disproportionately yeah. affected yeah. by. So around the 10th of March, yeah. but it's, it, there should probably should have been an action taken. Yeah. And then in the Sage Minutes, you don't really see care homes or retirement no. communities mentioned again no. until a month later right. when there's been serious death in care homes. I think people going into care homes were 10 times more likely to die than if they'd just gone gone home because of the because of the more than 10 times more likely to die. I think at the peak of the, the pandemic, the first wave, that they were 17 times more likely to die in a care home than had they just gone home to live with, you know, in a private home. Yeah, but that's because there's lots of reasons for that. You've got to unpack it. So firstly, it is the most vulnerable people who live in care homes. So their their vulnerability to the disease is much greater. Secondly, you know, the nature of care homes is obviously that the disease can spread more easily. And every European country uh, had this problem. But the broader point about the SAGE minutes um, uh, around that time, um, action was taken. But we didn't get to the policy that I think had the best impact, which was the stopping people from working in more than one care home mm. for several months afterwards. Yes, and it, is... if, if we'd if we'd known that that was going to be the thing that would say stop it mm. as much as it did, obviously we would have done that. Um, we would have done that earlier. Uh, but but again, it comes down to uh, to not knowing. Yeah, and I, I guess this is a point of judgment. Hindsight has revealed that that was a mistake. Some countries got it right. New York didn't get it right either, right. So, I mean, but other countries did get that. You know, and the right. other thing we were worried about, so we were worried about a different problem that didn't happen. And sometimes this, you know, it's you, it's important at the, to think about at the time the things we were worrying about. So in Spain, a whole care home full of elderly people had died because the staff had all gone home. So we were also worried about making sure that the care homes remained staffed because people in care homes die if the staff aren't there. So thankfully that never happened. But we were worried about the 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 care the you know we were worried about the opposite problem at the same time and um uh, and and you know thankfully we avoided one hmm. but but the other one came to pass. Do you look back on that that decision in particular because that's one of the big criticisms that a lot of people level at the um, handling of the, the the process. Do you look back at that as a another mistake in hindsight? Because you you as you say you were trying to make the best decision on balance. Yeah, right? I I know I know for sure. And what I, would you've done differently? Is maybe right. better. Yeah. What, what so on this foresight hindsight thing? I know for sure that I did my best, and I know that the team around me worked with you know did work with the right motives to get through as best we could. The um, the importance of learning how best to handle this situation, for God forbid, if it happens again, is absolutely vital. But I worry as much about learning the wrong lessons as learning the right lessons. So that's why it's important that we have this sort of discussion about, about the care homes in particular. Um, to, to make sure that just because something is in the narrative, it doesn't necessarily mean it's true. Uh, without doubt, if I'd known then what I know now, we would have brought in the staff movement rule much earlier. In fact, do you know what? You should probably have it in normal times as well, because lots of people die each year in of flu in care homes. And you know, so the and the and the processes of how flu gets into a care home are probably the same mm. as COVID because it's just another communicable disease. When people like mark the success of um, our handling of the pandemic, one of the ways that they choose to do it is to compare it to other countries. And in that first wave in particular, yeah. our deaths were just so much higher than the comparable countries. So does is that not an indicator that we messed up or that we got it or that our judgment calls turned out to be the wrong ones? A combination of a combination of things, right? A combination of things like the timing of the decisions yeah. to lock down, um, the obesity of our nation compared to others is one other uh, factor. Um, one of the factors that um, the experts think is a cause is that lots of people travel from all over the UK to Spain and Italy during that half term, and so it was brought back and seeded across the whole country mm -hmm. whereas other, some other countries like France had it very badly in a, in a couple of cities but didn't have the spread in the way we did so there's some things that are essentially you know just just facts of life that were outside anybody's control obviously that's not 
you know, what you're getting at. And it's not mm. the stuff that really affects how I think about it because it's the, it's the active decisions that mm. we also need to, you know, we need to go through and learn from. So would you, uh, that's what I'm saying is, yeah. is, is the, the, the large number of deaths that we had versus other countries, a indicator that we made poor decisions in that first wave? Well, now you see, Stephen, you're getting into gotcha questions. No, I, genuinely, cause, because we're going to so, come on to the good stuff, right? We're going to yeah, come yeah. on to the fact so, that we're out of lockdowns right. before everybody else. So the, but the way, the reason I, I reacted that way mm. is that, is that it is self-evident and obvious that you've got to improve decisions and learn from them. No, no. And the best, yeah, yeah. And the best proof point of this and the best um, sort of, it, it's obvious from anybody who's run any organisation mm. is you've constantly got to be asking, was that the best decision? And part of leadership mm. is to allow your team to essentially learn from and change their decisions, not stay stuck with them mm. just because that's the decision that we took. And in the second and subsequent waves, we have done relatively better internationally. So yes. how I feel about all that yeah. is I feel um, I feel sad that the f- performance in the first half, if you like, was not as good as it could have been. Okay, that answers the question. Yeah. And then I feel, and I, but I feel pleased mm. that we learned quite a few things mm. and in a way, you know, we did better mm. second time round. Yeah. But the thing I felt at the time and this is true in any organisation I've been in, is that if you want people to perform at their best, they have to know that if they screw up, they're not going to get shouted at. The question is not who did that, mm. it's how do we fix it? Yeah. And that was a that attitude was a big part of, um, of, of how things, you know, mm. we managed to get better. You know, testing is another example, right? Testing, first, it was, you know, it was far, we, we didn't have any, we built it as fast as we could, that needed to go much faster. By this Christmas, the Americans mm. were saying, why can't we have a testing system like uh, like the UK? Mm. You know, and my view is that uh, Dido Harding did an amazing job. But every time we had a screw up, the question that we asked was, yeah. how do we fix it? Not whose fault is it? Did you actually think that was a gotcha question? Because do you think do you think I'm the type of person that would sit here? And I don't think yeah, you are, yeah, which yeah. is why I called you out on it. Because- no, no, yeah, because it's every question I ask is honestly, honestly, genuine yeah because I, and, and then you're right there's so many things that we did better than all of these other nations and i'll be honest i'm sat here really lucky that we're able to do this in person right because of the decisions that the uk took so no what i meant by uh, gotcha is that you know the the question of um will you get the guy to say he that there was x screw up is a classic of the Today program. I, I base I, my and, thing, and actually, frankly, makes some of the decision making harder. For, no, I, I, no I, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, my question was that: is the was the, the the increase in death at the start? Does is that evidence, as people claim, that we made in hindsight? Because that's all we have now. In hindsight, the, yeah, the okay. decisions were wrong. And also, there's this other exacerbating factor, which was, I mean, the World Health Organization at the time, and even I tweeted it, said that. There wasn't, we couldn't wait for a vaccine. They said that we, that's what they said. They said we couldn't wait for a vaccine because sometimes vaccines, I mean, there's not a vaccine for SARS still. Sometimes I never they believe take that. five or 10. I never believe so that. You, so you, you, you thought there was always going to be a vaccine. Yeah. I had, and and, and, and it's true that uh, sometimes, yeah, in number 10, he was basically the only other person who agreed with me. Why did he say the take it on the chin thing? Because um, I use that in my well, tweet. He was, I, I remember that. He was, he was actually trying to argue against that. Oh, he really? was saying, he was saying, it comes down to how difficult it is to communicate in uncertainty. Mm. He was saying, some people are saying we ought to take it on the chin. Mm. I don't agree with that. Okay. I think we need to act. Fair. But so one of the reasons it's hard to communicate in politics and one of the reasons it's hard to communicate empathetically is that you have to both have the actual conversation, but also every single word you say can be twisted will be taken and analysed, for better or for worse, and I don't hold this against the media particularly, but they they will look at their, those words both within the context mm-hmm. and out of context. And so, you know, this is true of this interview, but I knew that coming into it and have decided just to try to answer the questions. Um, the um, But that is part of communication. So, I, I, the, the, the you know, Boris saying that um, some people say we should just 
what I can't remember the exact word. Take, take, take it on the chin. Take it on the chin, yeah. right? But I don't think that's the way we should do it. Instead, we should do it that way. It was written, written up as yeah. Boris Float's idea yeah, yeah. of taking it on chin. Well, he did float the idea, but he then immediately rejected it sure. for a different proposition. I, I did read the Sage Minutes and to to his and your credit, you don't mention herd immunity as a as the strategy to take forward in those minutes. Correct. From what I saw. So although that was a widespread narrative, right. it's not actually what was going on in the well, meetings. The truth there is that some people were pushing the herd immunity idea. Right. And then um the came, it came it came it bubbled up and came to a head. Yeah. And I had I went out and do you, killed it. So I was like, you, so, no, we are not doing that. So you you knew that a vaccine was going to be... I had... At first faith. it was faith, right? right? At first it was faith. And it gradually became more and more real. Okay. Um, and I just... I, I I knew that we'd got a vaccine for Ebola. Right. And the, the Oxford vaccine actually comes from the work several years before to get an Ebola vaccine. Mm-hmm. And I had... I just had this belief... And maybe it's because I'm an optimist. Once the data came out in about May that showed that only, you know, this tiny proportion of the public had had, mm. had antibodies and had had exposure. And therefore it was obvious and categorically impossible to get to uh, the levels of antibodies you need across society without mm. a huge amount of suffering and death. Um, i.e. the people who'd been promoting herd immunity were now evidently and scientifically wrong it wasn't just it was a bad idea it was provably a bad idea once we got to that point there was only one way out and that was a vaccine and you know i believe in the power of human ingenuity and i uh, believed in the team in oxford um and i also thought that when the whole world is searching for something then then somebody was going to get it right and mm. so we brought in uh, people to to go and buy from around the world like like Kate Bingham and we took this attitude which was sure we backed the British one but we absolutely we're going shopping as well right and 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 money is no object um and um and 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 that's what we did and thank god we did it was there a, a tipping point where because in the sage minutes there's this there's this understanding that this is going to go through the population and yeah. that really the the central objective has to be to protect the NHS and then was there a tipping point where you realised the vaccine was going to come and it was going to come quickly? Yeah. So the strategy then has to go to like, a, the vaccine's on its way. So now it's about actually limiting death as yeah. well. So it was, once we found out the, um, that uh, only a small proportion of the population had had it, mm-hmm. it was obvious from then on that the only way out was through a vaccine. And therefore the policy became to suppress the virus until a vaccine makes us safe. And I then repeated that all the way through the summer, the autumn. And in the autumn, I was arguing for, you know, to keep this thing under control because the vaccine's around the corner. And people were briefing against me that, no, you know, Hancock's the only one who believes in the vaccine and it's a running joke that there's only one person who thinks the vaccine's going to happen. And 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 partly to try to stop some of the complications that had happened in testing, I, report, I just spoke directly to the Prime Minister on this one and didn't go through his then advisors in number 10. And, 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 it, and, it, and it came good. We have a brand new sponsor for the podcast. And it's a brand called Crafted, as you can see on the table in front of me if you're watching this on YouTube. Crafted are a brand that sell really meaningful, affordable men's jewellery. And I've been a Crafted customer, I think, for about three years now. And all of the pieces that Crafted have created have deeper meaning. The piece of jewellery I wear the most, I want to introduce you to the pieces and why I wear them, is this sand timer, unsurprisingly. And the thing for me about a sand timer is it's probably the most clear reminder that our time here on earth is finite. And when you live in such a way where you can literally see your time pouring away and you realise that it is scarce and that we're not all here forever, you start to make better decisions. You stop worrying about pettiness and trivialities that consume our lives. I always have this crafted sand timer around my neck as a reminder of that. And this is why I wanted Crafted to sponsor this podcast because I can use their meaningful jewelry every episode to deliver a meaningful message. 
Quick one. As many of you know, I've been trying to make my life a little bit more sustainable as it relates to energy ever since I sold my Range Rover Sport and bought an electric bicycle. And my energy, as a sponsor of this podcast, is one of the brands that make that transition much, much easier. They are at the forefront of British renewable eco smart technology, and their products are really, really changing the game. If you're on YouTube, you can see what I'm holding in my hand. This is called the Eddy, right? It's the UK's number one solar power diverter. So what is a solar diverter? It's a device for people like you and me that means you can divert your excess energy back into your home rather than back into the grid, which will save you power and money. It's super user-friendly and easy to install, and you can control it using the My Energy app on your phone. To find out more about this product and more products like it that will help you make that sustainable transition, head over to myenergy.com and... Um, I highly recommend you check out the Eddie. It's um, it's a real game changer for a product and one that I'm going to be installing in my home soon. You talked about the uh, some of the p procurement rumors there. Yeah. One of them, particularly that you you, meant, you wanted to mention about a pub, a friend that runs a, is a publishing or something. Yeah. So the, so I mean, this is an example of why of how you need to go through these things properly, and how narratives can sort of spin out of control. And this is true on social media which you're a great expert in, but it's also true in the mainstream media. So for some reason that, I, that is lost in the mists of time, uh, some of the papers got the idea that the landlord in the village that I had previously lived in, in Suffolk, um, who had then gone on to uh, run this factory, had got a contract that I had given him. <laughs> and, you know, it was on the front page of The Guardian for several days, and it was... a and and it's just all it's not true. He didn't have a contract with the department. He didn't have a contract with the NHS. Um, he yes, he 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 flipped his factory to making those little plastic tubes. Uh, you know the ones that you um, stick your yeah, you know, yeah, your yeah. test thing into. But we needed millions of these things, and somebody had to. I didn't have anything to do with the contracting arrangements because he he was a subcontractor to another business. So there's no way that we. I mean, it's just a total. It's a total nonsense. And so. In, in a stressed period like a pandemic, a lot of conspiracy theories got going. This was one of them. There have been loads on, on vaccines from the <laughs> anti-vaxxers. And dealing... So you've got to deal with that misinformation at the same time as trying to make the best decisions as you can. And that is one of the, that is one of the hardest things to wrestle with in, in terms of how we communicate. The, um, the rumour around that time was that he'd sent you a WhatsApp message and you'd like forwarded him on to someone and that had led to him getting a... A deal. Yeah. So he, he, I mean, these WhatsApps have been, have been published under FOI. The, the WhatsApp was about something incredibly banal. It was about standardizing the size of these tubes across mm. different suppliers so that they could be made more efficiently. I mean, like a really in the weeds bit of policy. Right. That, and I just pinged this onto the people. I mean, I, 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 it was, okay. it, it, it was at a level of detail about eight below where I was okay. um, operating. There was in 2000, May 2021, there was there's some yeah. minor inadvertent breach because you held shares in a, a firm that had got a contract. No. No? So that's not true either. There you go. I mean, this is, um, I, I was I was given some shares in my sister's company, right? Um, and they had a contract, uh, an existing contract, with the Welsh NHS. Right. And I wasn't responsible for the Welsh NHS. So it's another example. How, are, you, are you familiar with that rumour? The... Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. I mean, I have to, I have to deal with the, these rumours all the time. And sometimes people stand up in Parliament and say it, and you just have to hit it on the head every time it comes up. It's just not true. But, the, but there's an underlying problem, which is that, you know, the people working to save lives in this period were working incredibly hard mm. to just deliver that as best as they could. And all the people who now mm. try to sort of say, oh, no, no, you were mm. trying to contract for this. It's just all total rubbish. I mean, you can't, the, there is no other description of it. On the 8th, I think it was the 8th of December. It you, was, yeah. Where that, that first vaccine was administered and you were yeah. on TV and got very, you cried. I did, TV. yeah. 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 Talk to me about that day and those feelings and what was going through your mind. Well, that was, it was incredibly emotional. It was because because we'd put everything into this and the very first vaccine down the track, so to speak, had worked, right? We bought six vaccines, uh, including the Oxford one. Um, actually, one of them only got approved about two weeks ago. And imagine if, 
you know, imagine if that if that had been the case for all six. So the fact that the very first one sailed through and has worked brilliantly, and then the Oxford one, like the home the home um, uh, vaccine, that also has gone brilliantly. Although the, you know there was a load of noise in the politics of it, and the Europeans getting shirty, but on a clinical basis has been amazing. Um, and um, so on the eighth of December, the first person receives it, and this is the way out of this terrible situation that we're all in, and all these people have died, and I knew that science was going to save us, but that wasn't the worst. You know, that was then the problem was at the same time, you know, we were having the second wave getting really big. So it was a really mixed period because we had the, the the joy that the vaccine was working. But at the same time, you know, cases growing. And um, I was on I was on uh, Good Morning Britain um, and I hadn't seen the image, you know, the video of uh, Margaret Keenan getting. I'm sure you're thinking of it now, right? We can all remember it. And I had but I hadn't seen that image. And they showed the image and I completely lost it. And I was, I was in floods of tears and totally lost control of my, um, of my, of my body and my voice. Um, and then I tried to pull it together and they said in my ear, you know, we're coming back to you in five. And, um, and I tried to pull it together. I just about got it together and then started talking to, I think it was Piers Morgan again. And on Twitter, they were like, this guy's making it up. He's not authentic. He was just trying to cry. And the honest truth was, if they'd come back to me like five seconds earlier, I would have been in a complete mess. And I was trying to hold myself together. And maybe maybe as politicians, we do that too often. I was Maybe I should have just been more relaxed about it because mm. I got a load of abuse for looking inauthentic because mm. I was trying to sort of be professional and, um, mm. and, 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 and not cry. Well, for me, that was actually the first time that I thought you you did have empathy. We right. know that, right? Because yeah. because I, I've said on this podcast, which you've listened to, I said that I thought you were an emotionless robot. Yeah. And I genuinely so outrageous. Ge- genuine, you know, I'm just being honest. Like I oh, yeah. genuinely, like genuinely, I, I've I think Jacinda in New Zealand has felt much more, I don't know, like human and emotional. And I think that gives gives me as a muggle, as a normal person, yeah. a sense that they understand me. So when I see politicians being a bit straight faced and tough, yeah, 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 you know who yeah. was really good at that? Barack Obama, he would cry. After Sandy Hook and these, these kids shootings, he would just cry. He would stand yeah. there in front of the nation and he would cry. And it made me realize that he felt the same way that I did. Whereas I, the reason I said you were, I thought you were an emotionless robot and I know you heard it, was because I'd never seen that. And part of the reason, I'll be honest, and I've got to be fair, part of the reason I'd never seen that is because you're put in situations where they are trying to always just get you, like five, 10 minutes. Well, that's that's part of so the reason. So you're defensive. That, yeah, right? so one of the things I've learned, de- without a shadow of a doubt, is that you've just, you, you've got to, um, you've just got to let that show. And I find, uh, you know, as a, I, I find that, um, I find it hard. Um and um, you just got to let that emotion show more, um, and 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 just just try to be, just try to say it as you feel it. Hmm. Um, the podium doesn't help, right? The very formal communication method, uh, you know, two Union Jacks, oak background. Um, the, so the podium doesn't always help to because it puts that a, a barrier in place. But then you mentioned Barack Obama, and you know he stood a bit. Stood a, you know, the podium wasn't a problem for him. Hmm. Uh, but what he is an extraordinary hard? communicator, right? He is an extraordinary. You said you find it hard to show that emotion. Yeah, because the na- my, uh, the natural instinct when you're under, especially when you're under pressure in questioning, is to say, is to sort of hmm. uh, go hmm. go alpha male. Hmm. It isn't always the best answer. Hmm. I think that is a problem with politics. I think that. Um, I think that the political leaders that probably will end up doing really well. And I don't, honestly, I don't see this on either side of the aisle. But you know, because, politics. because I'm relaxed now in the way that we're talking, there'll probably be something on mail online tomorrow, you know, Hancock's in such and such a mm. screw up, right? It, because that's how, I don't know what it is. I mean, we've been talking for so long, but I, 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 there is, there will be, um, that is how the media reacts. And so you, and so once you, once you, once you're, kind of experienced in seeing that reaction right Mm -hmm. you also then it tempers how you talk so actually coming in one of the reasons i wanted to come in and talk to you was because 
I want to just talk freely mm. and I don't care if that is on, you know, item mm. 10 of the mail online tomorrow. Mm. Um, I'm just trying to answer the questions as best I can. And I, I genuinely think that is a better way of, uh, of, of communicating in politics. And it's definitely something that I've learned. Yeah. And it's something that I've, I've just seen to be so absent on both sides of the aisle is um, a real sincere feeling of like empathy. And I think that makes politicians feel like they're not us. Yeah. More distant. Yeah. 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 No. And there's, there ends up being a language of politics. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and some people thinking that they don't understand the code of, you know, it's as if it's a, a code and, you know, there is a, um, and it's just, it, it, it's not helpful because it puts a, a, a barrier up. I work really hard at trying to do that. That's why I was so upset when I heard you say it. Somebody I really respect saying that I'm an emotional wreck or whatever. Not no, emotional, emotional wreck, the opposite. It's an emotionless it, it, robot. It, thanks. No, I've, uh, I've you got to be honest. Saying it. No, 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 but, no, but honestly, <laughs> for me, for me, it's, it's important to say because A, it's what I said and what I felt. And, and B, it's actually not just you. It's generally like the politics as, as a whole. I'm like, what I see in normal people is real empathy. And do you know what, do you know what the other thing is? It's language. Yeah. When you, when you, when you do those interviews on Good Morning Britain or whatever. Yeah. The language is not human language. It's very political and very controlled. And I, I think PR training is honestly I, a curse honestly, in politics. I work so hard not to do that. But, but, but that? it's, it's that, political training. But, but the, it is, and it's, but it's in particular in response to the aggressive questions. Yeah. Right? So you, you have not asked any aggressive questions. You've asked insightful questions instead. But when you're on, you know, when you get a da, 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 da type question, you give the da, 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 da type answer. Yeah. And that, and I think that's the issue is how do we get to a state where politicians go, do you know what? I know. That was a bit of a mistake. And I know. Hindsight's a wonderful thing. Do you know, I'll tell you, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a story. Um, the first time I did any questions uh, when I was new in parliament, um, I, um, you go for a meal before you do any questions. And, um, Nigel Farage was, was on as well and he had two pints and I and I said to him well, are you having two pints before going on any questions he said yeah because otherwise I can't talk freely and um, I sat next to him and he managed to get every single question to answer to an answer about why awful why uh, Europe was awful um, and um, uh, but he just absolutely you know he, he had a couple of pints and, and he sounded like he'd had a couple of pints now um, I don't, you know, whatever you think of his politics, his ability to communicate in a relaxed way. And I remember thinking every time I then saw him, that was years before the referendum. Every time I saw him, like you've obviously been drinking. <laughs> I mean, maybe maybe that's one way to, but I, I feel like it shouldn't have to. It, it, I think that the, the the people that are really going to resonate with the the public are going to be the normal people that break through without political PR training. Yeah. I think they'll resonate way more with people. I think Obama was, he felt like one of them to me. I know people, some people hate him and there's lots of things with drones and whatever, but he felt like someone in the way he spoke that I could relate to because I felt the sincere emotion. I don't really get that from Boris. I don't necessarily feel like Boris has the same. And then we go back. Oh, to I, dis of, you know, I disagree with that. I think that one of the reasons that Boris uh, relates to people and people relate to him is because he he doesn't speak in uh, as you, you know, mm. call it political speak. Um, one of the reasons he is such an effective communicator, whether you agree with him or not, um, is that uh, it is that he 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 doesn't play by those rules. I I, I understand what you're saying. He doesn't. F he didn't entirely feel like a politician. So come back to this question about like you know when we were talking about at the start about people's backgrounds. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, Boris has a background as different from the voters of Hartlepool as it's possible to get. Um, but, you know, he can he can reach people. Mm. And I think that's actually, I think he's a good, I put him in the Barack Obama category, actually. Really? Yeah, for, yeah, for people of a different politics. Yeah, I would. Because um, he, because he's one of the few people who, who, could, who really just... Um, uh, you know, we, we'll withstand the sort of criticism of the mm. of the next day's press in order to try to actually say how he mm. feels. He's a very, very um, emotionally engaged person. Let's talk about some of the stuff that you haven't really been able to speak about at length, which was in September 2020, we there was laws established that, well, not laws, but there was guidance given to stop us engaging within um, having casual sex with people outside of our household, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Do you think you can answer, ask the question in a little bit more respectful well, let me, way? So in September 2020, you said, 
this is what you said. Um, established couples should be, shouldn't be having sex. There should be boundaries. You warned against casual sex, advising the public to stick to well-established relationships yeah. and joking. I know I'm in an established relationship. And you told us to rem- remember the basics of hands, face, space. Yeah. And and throughout that period, hugging was not, I remember you saying that you were looking for tugging your mum and um, the 17th of May. And then all of this stuff comes out with the sun, the CCTV leak and everything in between. Yeah. There's a we, couple, there's obviously- Can we just start this section again? How, how, how would you like to start it? I don't mind it, all of it, except the opening bit about casual sex. Okay, fine. I haven't had casual sex with anybody. Okay. I fell in love with somebody. You, you went, so- And we're gonna, and- Let me casual. ask the question, and you can correct the question, right? So there's <laughs> there's all of this stuff, which what I'm saying is from the- well, let's start this bit again, okay, and, I'll, and I'll relax. Okay, fine. But you've got to let me ask the question. Absolutely. This is what we do here. We just, we just talk. There's no, this isn't- Yeah, so, but you've got, you've researched a bit about casual sex. No, no, I'm not no, gonna, I've not even asked the question yet. <laughs> okay, so, let's do get to right. that bit. So in September, 2020, you said that when, when asked that established couples, um, only established couples should be having sex. There needs to be boundaries. You no, no, get- no. Okay, so um, those rules yeah. were not in place. That but, was that was advice on TV. Yeah. But those rules were not in place when this all this happened. So there's a way that we can do this bit of the conversation, but we cannot do it with you starting talking about casual sex. Can, can I ask the question? You can ask a question, yeah. but let's ask a question in a reasonable way. Okay, so I'm going to ask okay, the question. Just, just, yeah. This bit is really hard for me as well. I, I completely understand. Yeah. I completely understand. I actually haven't asked the question yet. <laughs> This is so, all just a preamble. No, no, it's not. I, what the point? The, the point that's been leveled at you is very simple. It's that there's a contradiction in what you said mm. and how you behaved. That's what I'm. That's what I I'm totally going to. get that bit. So, can I ask that question? Yeah, go for it. So, the point that's been leveled at you is there's a contradiction in how you behaved yeah. versus what you, the guidance you were giving as health secretary. Yes, this is not a, a revelation. I mean, this it is, is what not everyone, a revelation. Exactly, this is what everyone's been saying. Hugging was advised against, you yeah. know, distance. There was this whole hands, face, space thing, which we were all told to obey. Yeah. And couples were, um, when, when, when asked, you were said to stick within well-established relationships. And you yeah. jokingly said, I know I'm in an established relationship. Then this CCTV stuff comes out. Yeah. My question is, you know, you talked earlier on about funerals and people going through an immense hardship. People say you, you were a contradiction. Yeah. What's your response to that? How do you how do you receive all of that when everyone? This is what everyone says. This is not Steve yeah. Bartlett has said it for the first time. No, so the whole world is saying at you. This yeah. is the central thing. Yeah, and this is ultimately why you resigned. That is my absolute. That is my response. So I resigned because I broke the social distancing guidelines. Yeah. Um, by then they weren't actually rules. They weren't the law. But that's not the point. The point is they were the guidelines that I'd been proposing. And, you know, that happened because I fell in love with somebody. And, you know, I've known Gina for more than half of my life. And we first actually worked together on student radio um, back in the Oxford days. And um, I brought her into the department to help with public communications in the same way we brought loads of brilliant people in who were experts in their field. Um, And so we spent a lot of time together, ironically trying to, you know, get me to be able to communicate in a more emotionally intelligent way. And, and, uh, And we fell in love. And, you know, that's something that, that was completely outside of my control. Um, and I, of course, I, I regret the, you know, the the pain that that's caused and the very, very, very public nature. You know, anybody who's been through this knows how difficult it is, how painful it is. Doing that in public is incredibly painful. And, um, uh, but, but, you know, I, I fell in love with someone. You, you, did you fall in love while working together? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, nobody, you know, we, we, it all happened quite, it all happened quite quickly. It actually happened after this sort of thing stopped being, after the rules were lifted, um, but the guidance was still in place. So I'm not trying to claim that, yeah, you know, I hold no bitterness about, about this because um, I broke the rules. You know, I fess up. I broke um, the, uh, the, the guidance. Um, and, you know, there were only two people responsible for this. 
Um, and, and, and ultimately that's why I resigned. I, I took responsibility for my decision and I resigned. Um, when that CCTV stuff happens, and I'm not going to go into the details of, cause I know I don't want to drag people into this, but I want to understand that, how that feels. I can only imagine having dealt with a pandemic and then yeah. getting this call from the sun yeah. that they're about to leak something. Yeah. I, I'd had for me, a, this is the, yeah. this is the, I would, f I don't like, I don't have the words to describe yeah. how that must have all felt. Yeah. Ta but tell me when you get that well, call. It, it was, it was, it was awful. Um, it was awful because, you know, we obviously knew what was going on, um, but we wanted to, uh, to, to do this as unpainfully as possible. And by and by the release of those images, obviously that caused a huge amount of pain, and um, the uh, and and it, it was it's 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 been. I mean, anybody knows, anybody knows how difficult it is. It you know ending a ending a relationship, um, and we have six children. You know, it, it's it, it it's tough, but you know. Um, Gina and I love each other very deeply. And, um, what, where are we? Seven, eight months later, it gets, it gets a bit easier with time. Um, and, um, but I have no sort of, I don't hold it against anybody have because I was, because, you know, we were, I take responsibility. Have have they figured out where that footage came from? Yeah, you know, so many people ask me this question. Everyone's asked the question. And um, uh, do you know my honest, the honest feeling I have in response to that question is I just don't care, right? The, uh, the actually, there's there's a funny story, which is that um, the best I know is that it was one of the um, security guards in the department. Um, there's a current ICO investigation. I don't know any of the details of that investigation. I haven't got any inside information other than that, which is public. However, the investigation uh, is based on a law, data protection law, that I took through Parliament, into which I personally put a journalistic exemption. So I'm, I, I don't hold it against, um, the, against the journalists for publishing it. Um, but obviously, you know, it was a very serious data data protection breach, if you like. The thing that re, we've learned, and I think all my other colleagues in cabinet learned immediately, is why did you have a CCTV in the Secretary of State's office? Obviously, I didn't know about it, mm. um, and um, because even who's in the office is a is a is an important fact and a and a sensitive piece of information. Um, but all of that is by them by because. You know, it is not the responsibility of others that um, that those social distancing guidelines were broken. You know, that is that is my responsibility, and I took responsibility for having done that. You took responsibility. You went to Boris. You said, you know, you'd ap apologise to him, and he considered the matter closed. And then th that's kind of where people thought it had been left off. But then I think the the, pre the media noise and the pressure built, and eventually the what? narrative is that you then resigned after. The yeah, after twenty four forty eight hours, it wasn't really after the, um, wasn't really the press. It was that, you know, some people I really respect got in contact and told me about things that they had been not able to do, like what, um, like you know, seeing dying relatives, and, you know, even though it, uh, you know, and and and, and I and I realised that it was it was unsustainable. Would you class that as the the worst time of your life? Being health secretary is not nearly as difficult as worrying about your children in a very public divorce. Um, undoubtedly, this you know going through that is undoubtedly the hardest thing I've ever done by a long, long way. And as, as you go forward on that particular situation, what's your like strategy? Because you've come from a home where your parents weren't 
they they they'd broken up, right? Yeah. So what's your what's your strategy going forward now to to try to mend, to try to be kind, to try to to try to um um to try to make you know on the fact obviously try to make things better. Mm. Um and then on the professional side, you know, I've got a other things I'm interested in. I actually don't miss the job as much as I expected, right? I'm, I actually, I, I'm really enjoying the freedom of being on the back benches on the professional side, and um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely, you know, um, I'm absolutely in love with Gina, and that that helps a bit. A lot of the um, since you've departed the front the front bench, there's, uh, I mean, now there's there's a lot of party gate stuff going on and yeah. it's kind of almost reminiscent of your situation because the, the claim level that the government is that there was a contradiction. There was all these parties going on into 10, 10 Downing Street. It sounds like it was a bit of, bit of a nightclub while the rest of the nation is was were locked down and obeying the rules. Yeah. You've not really been brought into that as much. No, I wasn't but, invited. <laughs> you weren't invited. But what's your what's your take on that? What's your because I'm sure you get asked about this. Well, it's, that's obviously very difficult. Um, but I do think you've got to look at the big picture of you know we're coming out of the pandemic now, and that's in part, in large part, because of the the big calls. But you resigned when when you had the I'll, I'll be honest, you had the decency to say right, I have been a contradiction here, and I've let people down. So you resigned, but. Yeah, but, you know, the Prime Minister uh, has so many other things on his plate as well, right? He's got Russia, Crimea, and he's got uh, the, um, you know, getting out of the pandemic. That was a big call, especially the response to Omicron, getting that right mm. and coming through first. So he's got all these other big things on his plate. What do you make of, um, I, I don't really have much to talk about on this particular topic, but there's all this Dominic Cummins stuff. Yeah. Yeah, he's become a very interesting character, a bit of a whistleblower, exposer type and, you know, you're, you've been supportive of Boris Johnson pretty much the whole way, even as you say with the party gate stuff, you say we need to look at the bigger picture. But he released some text messages that apparently are very critical of you, where Boris said that you, you fucked up ventilators and that you're totally fucking hopeless. Yeah, but remember at that time, it subsequently transcribed that Dominic Cummings was trying to get me fired. Right. And if you look at those text exchanges, they're like a diatribe against what I was up to. Right. And um, that didn't actually reflect what was going on. So, you know, the, the, I, uh, <laughs> Boris has apologised for uh, the way that came over. But actually, if you, um, and for, you know, for sending those messages, but actually, if you look at it in context, the context is this guy was trying to get me fired. He sent a load of um, aggressive messages to the prime minister. The prime minister responded as he did in a private setting, mm. never expecting that to become public. So um, I'm completely, you know, what, what you know, there, there are... There are there are people who really want to fix things and improve things in life, and um, uh, and uh, I'd rather be that type of a person. Fixer. Speaking of fixing things, yeah, one of the things you're really focused on fixing at the moment, and I've seen you talk about this in Parliament and in several other places, and a lot of the interviews you're doing on Twitter is this issue of dyslexia in our country. Tell me why you, you alluded to it earlier. Why yeah. this is personal to you? So, so I was only identified as dyslexic at university. And I know, despite really good teachers, it would have been so much easier for me because before I was identified, I just thought I was stupid and I'm bad at English. And some people say you shouldn't identify, you know, you shouldn't tell dys dyslexic kids they're dyslexic because then they'll be labelled. But I labelled myself as, 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 as useless with words and kids do that. But still today, only one in five children are identified at school. And... I think this is ridiculous, especially in a world where you can have online assessments that can't then they can't give you the formal diagnosis, but they can give you the data that says this person's high, this child's highly unlikely to be highly likely to be dyslexic. So I'm campaigning for that, and in a way, it's one of these things that you know. Now that I've got, I can choose how I spend my time as a backbencher. This is something I really care about. I never got round to doing it in government. I actually had assembled a little team to push on this in the Department for Health after the election before, but those people got moved on to have to deal with the pandemic. So for me, this is unfinished business. And for the, you know, hundreds of thousands of dyslexic kids out there, if I can show them, if I can show just one of them that you can, you can succeed as a dyslexic person, 
and you can make it as long as you get the support you need, as long as you get, you know, you get identified, um, then then it, it will have been worth it. So it really, really matters to me. And I, I'm sure we can make loads of progress. When you when we talked about you doing, having this conversation with me here, there was I remember you saying there was things that had been said that you wanted to kind of have a chance to address and rebuttal. Do you feel like you've had a chance to address and rebuttal those things? Yeah, I have. Um, I feel like, you know, because we've have been able to have a long conversation, you know, there's a few of those, um, a few things I've been able to explain, explain the thinking behind. Um, but I also hope that we can have a proper um, debate about how this, how the pandemic side is dealt with properly in the future. And um, we can learn, learn the lessons as best we can. And I think that's important. Every guest in this podcast, you might oh. be aware of this tradition, leaves yes. a question in the diary of a CEO. And I don't read it. And I swear on my, I swear on all my family that I, that I don't read it until I open the book. So forgive me if I, it takes me some time to read the handwriting. Okay, here we go. So the last guest on the Driver CEO podcast left this question for you. If you were lying on your deathbed, what three things would you want to have achieved in life? Oh, well, that's okay. a great. Three things. Three things God. you would want to have achieved in your life. Pretty ambitious. Um, the number one is I want my children to be happy and 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 have fulfilling lives. That is that is uh, uh, undoubtedly number one. The second is that I will have want I want to have a happy and loving and fulfilling um, life and relationship, uh, you know, for the rest of my days. On just. Because of what's happened with Gina, Gina's actually here today, it's worth saying. Yeah. That's okay, I'm okay to say that. Yeah. Right? Um, because of what's happened, I'm guessing it's made, it's the scrutiny around, because relationships are hard already. Yeah. But the, the context and the scrutiny around that, yeah, what's happened must, it can't make it easier. We've been through a lot together. Okay. Um, and, you know, that's the, that's the joyous bit. That's the easy bit. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of very difficult things that I have to deal with, um, you know. And um, having fallen in love with Gina is the, that's the easy bit. And the third one? And the third one, um, I hope that, I hope to have, I mean, it's sort of both, it's so obvious, um, but it, and I'm going to put some, I'm going to try to answer it more specifically. Um, I hope to have improved the country that I love. Um, and, you know, if, for instance, that is making sure that every single dyslexic child gets both the the capability to read and write and um, be effective and the self-esteem that comes with that, then that would be that would be wonderful. And I'm lucky to have a platform in Parliament um, and through the fact that I'm fairly well known to be able to to um to try to affect change and that's what i want to do thank you thank you for both your time because i know it's in tremendous demand but also thank you for choosing to have this conversation here these conversations aren't easy so it's often easy to uh, um, easier to avoid them and you know we talked about the importance of emotion and relatability in politics so i want to thank you for taking the time to have a conversation where you didn't set any restrictions on me my line of questioning at all and you let me ask the questions which as a qu quite naive person who isn't politic um really political um would have and i think that's a credit to you and i i, I thank you for that and um yeah well thanks for giving me the chance i don't think you're naive at all you're self-knowing and you know that's the most important thing to know well, thank you, Matt.